it great to be able to come to church? Huh? And you know what? The bit that we've just had, that's my favorite bit of church. It's worshiping the Lord. That's my favorite part of coming to church. Is to come and gather with God's people and to worship my Savior. It's the most amazing bit. All the other stuff is good. You know, this bit where we get preached at and preached to and, you know, spoken to and all that stuff. That's good. And people, some people look forward to that. They want to get a word. They want to receive some instruction or direction. And that's all good. But to me, the best part is coming and worshiping God. Most amazing bit. How many of you agree with me? Huh? That's why we do it so much. Are you with me? Because all, all, all the other stuff that we do is us. It's for us, really. But that bit, that's, that's for Him. Huh? That's for Him. Praise the Lord. Help me to pray. Father, we are so grateful to be able to come into your presence together as a church, a body of believers. People even that don't believe can come into this place and hopefully connect with you. My God, teach us today, train us, reveal yourself to us in a new dimension, in a new way. Lord, let your anointing flow amongst us, oh God, that we would leave changed, transformed, more like you. My God, we give you all the glory today. We thank you for your word. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. As you take your seats, we want you to turn in your Bibles. Psalms 122 verse 1. I'm just going to read one verse. And I want to talk to you today very quickly about the subject of church. Church. Um, many times we come and we speak. And, you know, throughout the summer, we... we we haven't really had a series that we've been concentrating on. Normally we have series that we run through, that we can go through different aspects of, of the Bible, of God's Word. But throughout the summer, we've kind of been, been just, you know, flowing with the, 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 the pace of God and with the Spirit of God. And uh, today I want to talk about church. Very important, this, this idea of church, because it's not man's idea. It's God's idea. Amen. This verse says something key to us. 122 verse 1 Psalms. It says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. You know some people, when they come to church, especially in the summer, you have what's called the summer slump. Right? When we, when we get together as pastors, we talk about the summer slump. And that's the time, pastorially, when we know as pastors that from July sort of time when the kids go off school all the way through to when the kids go back to school that some of the adults don't come to school. <laughs> Amen. People go on vacation, they go on holiday and that's all fine and that's all great. But how many of you know that sometimes the sun comes out and people stay away from church and they call it the summer slump and we... You know, we, we generally press through that in this church. We still do our outreaches. We still do stuff. But as we've grown, we have more families now than ever before. And people go on a holiday. And how many of you know that in the school holidays when you've got kids, it's double, double the expense? Well, liberty. Huh? Right or wrong? I think we should pray about that. Amen. When you've got little kids, it don't matter. You, you don't have to take them out of school, but... When you've got big kids, you get fined for taking them out of school. Are you with me? And then you get fined for taking them on holiday out of school. It's like some crazy thing. But it's very important that we understand about church. Some people, it's like you say, let's go to church. It's like saying to them, let's go to the dentist. Huh? Kind of, mm, they go there with trepidation. I'm going to stay there. I hope it's not too long. Let's get away as quick as we can. But other people, they understand what church is about. I want to give us a little bit about church today. Because I'm like the psalmist. I'm glad to be able to come to church. 
I've been coming to church now for 23 years. And I've been coming to church faithfully, regularly, you know, for 23 years. Two, three, four, five, six times a week, however long. Before that, I never went to church. I went to church, funerals, maybe, if it was a close family, you know, close family or a friend. Sometimes weddings, although the lifestyle I lived, not many of my friends got married. Hello. Huh? You didn't go to church. But now we have the ability, the, 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 the tremendous opportunity to come to church. And it's an opportunity that we have in the West that other people in different places around the world, they do not have the same opportunity. But sometimes we take it for granted, don't we? And sometimes we, we pick and choose when we're going to come. But what is church? Huh? Church is God's idea. And it is a great place to be. When Jesus was talking with his followers once, he asked them who they thought he was. Matthew chapter 14. Simon Peter, who we looked at last week, he, he answered, they, they were saying, some say the prophet, some say John the Baptist, some say this. But Simon Peter, he said, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus then replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You didn't learn this from any human being. This is one thing we have to understand, that lots of people know about Jesus. Not as many as there used to be. But lots of different religions know about Jesus. Lots of different people know about Jesus. But to know who he really is, is something that is revealed from the Father. It's not something you work up. It's not something you get captured into. It's something that God himself, the Father, reveals about his Son. And it's something that happens in your heart. He goes on, Jesus says, he says, you didn't learn this from any human being. He says, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, there's a different rock, right? It's not upon Peter. It's not, the, you know, the Roman Catholic Church kind of think that the Pope is, you know, the descendant of Peter based on this scripture. It's not about that. It's about the revelation and it's about the confession and it's about the understanding of who Christ is. That is our foundation. Not a person. Are you with me? The revelation of who Jesus is, is the rock and the foundation of our faith. He said, and upon this rock, upon your confession of faith, upon the revelation of who Jesus is in your life, he says, I'm going to build my church. You have to understand that it's not about one person in one city somewhere else. The revelation of God to a person is where God's church begins to be built. And Jesus is the one that builds it. He says, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. See, not only is church God's idea, but Jesus is committed to build it. Man, I've been in all different places. I've been a missionary in the Middle East. I've been a missionary in the Far East. I've been a missionary in places where you can't openly have church. You can't come to church and have church like this because you'd be shut down, you'd be hunted down, you'd be opposed, you'd be abused, and you'd even be arrested. But we still had church. We just did it super sneaky. Huh? Like secret squirrels, like secret agents, praise the Lord. But we would still have church. And what you find is that people would walk for miles to come to church. I remember when I was in India once and we had a, a big crusade. You've got to be careful about calling it a crusade in the Middle East, let me tell you. You have to change the terminology. But in India, it was a crusade. It was a, a, a gospel campaign. And we had this tremendous uh, uh, service. We, we'd actually, we were going to have a, a, a female black gospel singer from America, well-known gospel singer, was going to come. We were going to do a big concert. We gave out, 10 of us gave out 450,000 flyers advertising this thing. And then a week before, she phoned up and said she couldn't come because she was sick. So we're like, what are we going to do, man? I was even going to dress up. <laughs> Pretend. Are you with me? But in the end, we got a friend of ours, Art Blahos, who's an ex-mafia assassin, saved miraculously, blah, blah, blah. He came, and uh, he turned up thousands of people there, and there's, they've all got their flyers of this little black gospel singer. 
And in comes this big Mexican dude with a big moustache covered in tattoos. And uh, people were thinking, wow, there's a transformation right there. You know, we believe in transformation. Anyway, he gave his testimony, just gave his testimony, and God's power just moved in his testimony. And a guy got healed, st stood up, come running forward. He was deaf and dumb from birth, started hearing and speaking, and we started seeing miracles. But what we found out was that there were people that were coming for walking for four, five, six, seven, eight kilometers to come to that service. And then after they'd seen the power of God, when we had church the next day, they were coming from everywhere. And they were walking, or they were on their little mopeds, five of them. In the Middle East, people would walk from their villages. They would come from different places because they wanted to come to a place where God was, where they could meet together. And how many of you know a church alive is worth the drive? When there's power in the house, when God is in the building, then people are willing to come. Powerful stuff. He's committed to build it, whether we understand it or not. In the West, we have this individualistic thing going on, don't we? Where everything's private. Everything's about I, me, and my. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. That's my boundary fence. You even hear it, don't you? People having wars over where the boundary fence is situated. You know, whether they're in there. Man, we, we haven't got a drive in our house, so we have to park on the road outside. How many of you know that sometimes it can be a battle? People park outside. We had a guy park outside our house and leave his car there for a whole weekend and he lives down the road. So you know what I did? Because my wife needs to park, right, because of her disability. So it's cool, you know, people park wherever. We park down the street. Then I realized no one's coming for this car. It was like five days, six days. So in the end, I thought, I'm hunting this dude down. I went and knocked on everyone's door. And I found him. <laughs> I said to him, I'm looking for the owner of this car. This little green sports car, even though it's mine. I said, can you come and move it? He went, all right then. <laughs> but how many of you know you get battles about this stuff? It's mad, right? Huh? How many of you have ever had a battle like that about something? Huh? Neighbours are too loud. Loud neighbours? Come on now. Parties? Huh? Dogs and cats? Cats? Right? <laughs> And we have this individualistic thing. If you go to Malaysia, you go to the Philippines, you go to India, you go to China, you go to places in Africa, it ain't like that. I've been in places in different parts of the world and you're sitting down talking to someone and all of a sudden another family just walks in. They just walk in the house and park up and start eating the food. Right? It's like, imagine they did that here. Imagine they did it in Wigan or Bolton huh? or in Hume. Come on now, Salford. Someone just walked in. They'd be walking out real quick. Because we live in an individualistic society and it's empowered that way. It's powered that way. It's about control and it's about division. But how many of you know God is not about that? God is about community. And sometimes one of the biggest things that you have to fight against with church is this individualistic mentality where it's all about me. Even to the point where some people don't think they need to come to a church or be in a church to be a Christian. Well, I can just be a Christian. It's about me and God, isn't it? Huh? But that, that's not what the Bible speaks about. There's a community. So what is church? Paul the Apostle explained it like this in one of his letters in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. He says this. He says, God has put all things under the authority of Christ. He has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. The church here, the word church, is a Greek word in the Greek original language called ecclesia. And ecclesia was not a religious word. It was a secular word. Are you with me? It just meant a popular meeting. I went to, how many of you have ever been to uh, Old Trafford, Man United? Lift up your hands. Come on, don't be ashamed. Why are you being ashamed? Huh? In United, there is a piece up there, a big banner. It says, Old Trafford is my heaven. Did you know that? Because how many of you know that 
Old Trafford is a church, right? It's not as holy as the London Stadium where West Ham play, but nonetheless, it is a church. It is a gathering, a popular meeting of people. But it was taken on in the New Testament as a meeting of people for the purpose of worshipping Christ. What differentiates a church from a club or a church from a nightclub or another meeting is Christ. An ecclesia was a body of people. The difference with church is that we have a head. All the other people just have a body with no head. And they just run around worshipping these different teams like headless chickens. But we have a head. We have a purpose. We have a mind. We have vision. That's the difference with a church. We are a gathering of people. To the Jews, there was a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue. Now, check this out. For everyone, and and all of the original apostles were, were Jews, so they understood this. But for everyone that believes that you can go to church on your own, everyone who has this misconception that that scripture that says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am, means church, it doesn't. That's to do with discipline. It's not to do with your church. That's to do with disciplined people, right? The Jewish synagogue could only be a synagogue if it had 10 adult males. So you couldn't get two Jewish bods standing around doing their thing, thinking, oh, we're not going to go to the temple today or the synagogue. We're going to do it ourselves. It wouldn't work. There's no community in it. There's no power. Are you with me? So church needs a group of people. You can't do it on your own. Amen? Are you with me? It's an assembly. So originally, church was the community of people who were called out of society, out of the selfish world system, to partner with Jesus, that's a very important word, and follow him in his purpose of removing every obstacle between us and the Father of all creation. That's his job. That's what he wants to do, and he wants us to partner with him in that. Church is us. It's you. We are the body. I don't know what part you play. You might be an elbow. How many of you know, if you, how many of you have ever not been able to use your elbow? Huh? You might be a big toe. You might not be the, the, the mouthpiece. You might not be the worship leader. You might not be the preacher. You might not feel important. But how many of you know, without a big toe, you ain't going very far. Big toes are important. Huh? And that's just the visible stuff. What about the invisible stuff? What about the liver? Try living without a liver. That's why it's called a liver. You can't see it, right? But how many of you know if you didn't have one, you'd be in trouble? Huh? But when was the last time someone come up to you and said, all right, bruv, love your liver? And sometimes what can happen is we can be involved in church, but we might not be seen. And sometimes we don't feel that we're part of church. We just attend a church. No, no, no. You are the church. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are the church. But not only is it a people, it's also specific places that you gather. When you read through the New Testament, you see that there were churches in this city and churches in that city and churches in the other city, right? And it was a gathering place. People would gather together and they would gather in place. We gather in an old warehouse. Some people gather in old churches or cathedrals. And the thing is, we are still a church, but the church in the city. Oh, you ain't catching this. Victory Outreach Manchester ain't the only church in the city of Manchester. We're part of the church of the city of Manchester, but the city of Manchester has a church. We're a congregation in that church. Can someone say amen? And we work together. All this fighting and denominationalism and all that stuff, it gets in the way. It's like that individualistic stuff. Well, this is what we believe, that's what you believe. You stay over there and I'll stay over here. Huh? It's like having two hands on the same body and neither of them will come near the body. Well, that's my church. That's your church. You stay over there. Stop it. And we even do it in church. Huh? But what about this church? 
What sort of church are we? I want, three, want, to, want to let you know three things about our church, Victory Outreach Manchester. And this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it's an important one. Amen? Number one, we are a Christ-following church. You might say, well, you know, that's, that's self-explanatory, but you'll be surprised. Are you with me? Our agenda is Christ. Our agenda is to follow Christ, to worship Christ, to glorify Christ, to live for Christ, with Christ, for his honour and his glory. Huh? That means that we believe that Jesus is God the Son, fully God and fully man. We believe that he is the only saviour. There's no other way of salvation. There's no DIY salvation. There's no do-it-yourself salvation. He is the only way to salvation. We believe that he was born of a virgin without being conceived by a human father. Technically, Joseph was his stepdad. That causes a lot of controversy over people, with people. But we believe that. Amen? Do you believe that? He was born, someone said, for a virgin's womb under a sign that said no entrance. Hallelujah. And he was born right where he was prophesied as being born in Bethlehem. At the time he was supposed to be born. In the place in Bethlehem that he was supposed to be born. Where all the lambs were birthed that were going to be used as sacrifices in the temple. You'll hear about that one at Christmas. Huh? We believe that Jesus lived a perfectly sin-free life. He died innocently. And this is important. So that his life would qualify as being a substitute for our life. This is what we believe. Some of you are like, I know all this stuff. But you'd be surprised how many people actually believe this stuff. Huh? We believe that he was resurrected physically alive. Not just spiritually. Physically alive. He actually died and then he rose physically from the grave, never to die again. The only man ever in history that's ever done it. Huh? And we believe that he was seen alive by hundreds of people who could testify and wrote books and are eyewitnesses of this thing. We believe that. Then we believe that he ascended to the Father, where he is now, seated at the right hand of the Father, uh, 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 of the presence of God. You know what he does? You know what he is? He's a representative of you and me right there in heaven right now. Humanity. It's not just God, it's humanity up there right now, clean and set free. That's why we can have access to him in prayer. That's why we can go before him and pray. That's why we can be forgiven. That's why we can have hope. That's why we can change. That's why we can be transformed because of this stuff. This is what we believe. And also we're waiting in hope and anticipation and expectation for his return. I mean, if you know he's coming back. Oh. I mean, if you want him to come back. There's times I want him to come back as quick as, quick as possible. Some of the singles are like, don't come back yet, God. <laughs> Married people are like, come back whenever you want. <laughs> singles are like, leave it until I'm married. Don't come back before I'm married. There's no marriage in heaven. I'm going to miss out. Some of you ain't missing out, let me tell you. You've got to make sure, men, that you marry Miss Right, not Mistake. Hello. Huh? Praise the Lord. We also believe that that gives us a vision and a mission of great purpose because we're to reach people and tell them this stuff, man, and show them this stuff. It's also why we don't want to waste time tickling people's ears or their egos. When we come to this church, we worship God. We're unapologetic about it. Lift up your hands and worship God. Be loud, be crazy, be quiet, whatever, but worship God. We're unapologetic. I'm unapologetic about the word that I bring. I'm not going to tickle your ears and tell you everything's going to be all right. I'm not Bob Marley. Amen. Huh? Sometimes you've got to worry about some stuff. Worry about sin. Amen. Huh? The Bible says be anxious for nothing unless you're in sin. Praise God. Huh? Don't want to waste time, man. There's too many hurting people. There's too many people in our immediate families, in our friends, amongst our neighbours. Even our workmates, even the stranger that you walk past with pain etched on their face. I mean, have you ever seen someone and you've known that they're going through something and they're a stranger and you just stop and say, you all right? I've done it many a time. I've seen people 
There was one, one, one guy I reached out to in Camden one time, just a strange dude, but he looked like he had a black cloud over his head. I said to him, I stopped him, I said, excuse me, mate, you might think this is weird, but I want to I wanna just ask you if you're all right. I know I'm a stranger, I know it's weird, don't get me wrong, but I, I, I just have this sense, I'm a Christian, I want to, I you know, I believe God stopped me to talk to you, and then it starts getting weird, doesn't it? People are like, oh, here we go, nutter. But this, I've had it time and time again, where this dude went, you know what, I've come here from Basingstoke, he was in Camden. He said, I've come here from Basingstoke to kill myself tonight, because I've had enough of it. And I was able to speak to him, and he didn't kill himself, and he gave his life to Jesus. Sometimes, there's urgency. Are you with me? There's an urgency in this stuff. Look at the people we have in the homes. Huh? The men and women that come in the homes. The urgency. One fix away, one smoke away, one pipe away, one drink away from destruction. But that's why we don't tickle people's ears. We believe and follow Christ, and that's what he did. And we really believe that God can transform anyone's life. Don't matter where you come from, it matters where you're going. And it matters who's waiting for you. Are you with me? How many of you, your life's been transformed? Let me see your hands. By Jesus. See? Huh? And not, not all of you were drug addicts. Huh? People are what it's all about. And that's what the church is for. And that's why Jesus started it. Number two, we're a full gospel believing church. What does that mean? That means we preach and teach what the Bible says. And we expect what it says will happen, will happen. So we'll pray for people that are sick. And we'll believe that God will heal them. He doesn't have to. There's no magic involved. But I guarantee this. I challenge you in this. Pray for 50 people in faith that God is going to heal them. And if you get to 50 and God hasn't healed any, forget it and say that it don't work. I challenge you. Amen. Come back to me after praying for 50 people and God hasn't touched one of them. You come back to me, and then I'll, you know, say, all right then. <laughs> because I've never known it. Huh? We believe it. We're not charismaniacs. You have in church, you have on one side, you have the frozen chosen. Amen. I believe that they're the only ones that were destined for salvation. Everyone else is destined for hell. I've looked into all that. I believe it's a load of tosh. Then you've got, on the other hand, you've got the charismaniacs, right, that believe that everything is, is, you know, everything's God. The slightest little wind, slightest touch, they're making shapes like trees and turning into animals and barking like dogs and doing all sorts of stuff. And we have a mantra here that we tell people, listen, we believe in the power of God, but if you start barking like a dog, one of the security will take you out for a walk. We're not charismaniacs. But we, we believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We believe that God can give you a word in season for someone. We believe that God can work miracles still today. We believe that there is a gift of faith which moves mountains. We believe that some people get the discernment of spirits. And you can tell when something's taking place. There's the gifts of the Father that are creational gifts. You might be athletic. You might be mathematic. You might be good at this or good at that. That's a creational gift of the Father. Then there's the gifts of the Son that... Some are raised up to be apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers, or evangelists to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Then there's the gifts of the Spirit that God comes upon people at different times to do His will. We believe in that. We believe. And sometimes that makes people uncomfortable. But I mean, you know, comfort and change are not best friends. And sometimes we need to be made uncomfortable in certain areas of our lives. The gospel should change your life, not just your behaviors, not just your habits or your lifestyles or your beliefs. Jesus didn't die for your issues. He died for your sin. Your issues are a secondary thing. The woman with the issue of blood got saved through her faith. He turned around, Jesus, when she touched him, Jesus turned around and said, daughter, your faith has saved you. But her issue was dealt with as well. I mean, if you know, when I got saved as a drug addict, as a drug dealer, as a heroin addict, I got saved from sin. Then my addiction was broken. But he saved me. Are you with me? 
Your actual life needs to change. But that means speaking about real stuff. If you're sick, a doctor will tell you the truth. If you've got issues, you can get a counsellor. But sin can only be taken away by the Saviour. Huh? Sometimes we'll listen to a doctor though, right? They tell us that we've got something wrong, we'll listen to them. Sometimes you listen to your counsellor. But sometimes when a pastor comes and he starts speaking to you real stuff, you look at him like, who are you? Well, actually, he's a representative of God right in that moment. Listen to him. Are you with me? Huh? The message of the gospel is not that Jesus is just a free ticket to heaven or a meal ticket on earth. You have to understand that. And once you understand that, your life is going to change. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus reconnects us with the creator of all life and promises us fullness of life in every area of life. But you need to walk in faith in him, with him, partnering with him. Being a true Christian and actually having your name written in Jesus' eternal guest list in heaven, which is called the Lamb's Book of Life, means that you've experienced a divinely inspired and empowered transformation where you've exchanged your old life with all of its wrongs for Jesus' new life with all of its rights. If you can say that, then you can say that you're saved and you then are part of the church. And your salvation is then tested by the fruit that comes from that new tree. Paul describes the fruit of the Spirit in nine terms in Galatians 5.22. Peter urges the development of seven accompaniments to faith in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8. And in two of these terms that are common to both lists, love and self-control. You've got to love and you've got to have self-control. Amen? Are you still with me? Here's me sweating and spitting and doing all that stuff because I'm passionate about it. I hope that you're receiving something. Number three, we're a church of partnership and opportunity. You have to understand that when you come to church, you come to church as an individual, but you could become part of a community. As part of that community, it's important that you work in partnership with that community. It's like my right hand just all of a sudden just slapping my face for no reason. Huh? What are you doing? Well, I just thought I'd do that. No, 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 you've got to work in cooperation. Amen. And sometimes we bring our gift in. What about if you've got an itch? Right? You can do the Baloo the Bear thing up against the doorpost, but imagine your hand could just come and just scratch that itch. That's working in partnership. It's using its ability. It's using its gifting. Are you with me? It's not just about coming and being entertained. It's about coming and becoming a part of things. Getting involved. Becoming a part of the community. And many people have many different giftings. Huh? Many people have different qualities. You'd be surprised in this place how many qualities of people we have. The professions. When me and Vicky first come up here, the only professions we had in church were pharmaceutical salesmen, <laughs> drug testers, and chemical engineers. <laughs> Amen. Because so everyone was a drug addict or a drug dealer. Praise the Lord. Huh? Or they were into shop inventory. There was a couple of bank workers, but mainly in the withdrawal section. But now we have highly educated people. How many of you have got a degree? Put your hand in the air, wave it like you just don't care, you've got a degree. Praise the Lord, we've got more degrees than the Masons. Amen. How many of you got kicked out of school? All right. Praise the Lord. But yet still you have gifts. Huh? How many of you are a professional? You get paid for what you do. That makes you a professional, right? You get paid for what you do. Amateurs don't get paid. How many of you get paid? Now, I guarantee that some of the things you get paid for, you don't utilize in the church. Because doing it in the church means you do it for free. Hello? Huh? Or, to give you a little bit more leeway, sometimes you don't do it in church because you don't think there's a place for it in church or an opportunity for it in church. But I want to let you know, man, that church is a place of opportunity. Are you with me? There's whole scriptures about carpenters in the church. There's whole scriptures about artisans, fishermen. There's whole scriptures about goat herders. Huh? Scriptures. 
where they're involved in the life of God. They're in the eternal word of God. So accountants, bank managers, business owners, chefs, care workers, healthcare professionals, secretaries, proofreaders, web designers, sound and lighting people, singers, musicians, drivers. Come on now. Sports people. Hello. All of these nutritionists. I mean, you know the church needs some nutritionists. Are you with me? Architects. Wow. What else? Financial advisors. Doctors. Dentists. Scientists. Chiropractors. We need a chiropractor in church. Amen. I need to get me back cracked. Praise the Lord. But all of these places have opportunity in church. And this is a church of opportunity and partnership. Time's gone. Anthony's coming. Some people will say, I don't want to get involved because the church is full of hypocrites. Yeah, well, so's your workplace. You're not going to go to work anymore? So the doctors, you go up there and sit in a waiting room filled with hypocrites. You're not going to go to the doctor's waiting room when you've got a sore throat anymore and you need some medication because there's hypocrites. What about getting on the bus? Might be hypocrites sitting there. Don't get the bus then. Walk. Walk, stay sick and don't go to work and don't have any money because you're surrounded by hypocrites. <laughs> Church is not a place of the perfect. That's for heaven. Church is a place for people that are coming to perfection. Jesus Christ. To be perfected through him. In his blood, positionally. And then as they walk it out and work it out. But we want people to get involved, man. Amen? We want you to get involved. We need you to get involved. The church is us. I want to do one, one, one thing real quick. I was debating whether to do this today or not. But I'm not going to put it off. It's God's will. I could preach for longer if they gave me time. I could probably preach better if I wasn't so tired. But we've been trying to build this thing, and it's not for us. It's for all the people that we've reached and all the people that we've touched. You know, there's thousands of people that have been through this ministry that their lives have been changed. And we do it with people's donations with people's giving, with their tithes and their offerings. And we steward it very well. And one of the things I'm very, very into is transparency. I'm into integrity. And we've done very well for a long time. And the church has grown from a handful of people 15 years ago to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that we see today. You know, it, we, we couldn't fit everyone into one, one service. Come in September, we might even need to go to three because the amount of people that we have that come. But one thing we need to do is we need to upgrade in the area of our quality. Because if we want to grow, we need to develop. Now last year what we did is we needed an office manager. As our administration was developing, we needed an office manager. And our tithes and offerings that come in to this church pay for all the things that you see. They pay for five different homes that we run for people coming off of drugs and out of gangs and crime. They pray for the youth initiatives. They pray, they pay for the, the, all, the, all the different stuff that takes place. But what we did was we needed an office manager. So I, I prayed and God gave me this, this idea to do the 120 club where for 120 people, right, pay, how much was it? 20 pound a month. Then if we did that on top of their tithes and offerings, we would be able to bring in a quality office manager. And they had to pay it for a year, 20 pound a month on top of everything. And boom, everything's got better, right? We brought on Ayanda, we gave her a job. You know, she works, she does stuff. Then after a year, it stopped. And the church had grown enough that we could absorb her wages. So we'd grown into her wages. It was amazing. But now what we need is we need an accountant. We need someone that's going to help us out because there's so many different laws now. There's so many different, different things. And, you know, as things grow, we need an accountant. And it's a step of faith. To get an accountant, not just a bean counter, not just someone who knows what they're doing, that we could, not just an outside person that comes in, but someone that can be on staff that can do this stuff. So we have someone in mind, we've approached him, he's putting his notice, we've taken it on faith, but now 
what we want to do is we want to raise the finance to be able to pay his wages for a year. Then after that year, boom, it'll be done and the church will have grown enough to be able to absorb it. So I was praying, God, how do we do it? And he said, well, is it a vision? I said, yeah, it's a vision, man. We want to grow. We're planting a church this year coming up in Birmingham. Next year, we're planting another one by God's grace. We've got four church plants on the go at the moment. One in London that's growing. Liverpool that's blowing up. We've got one in Germany that's blowing up. Amen. And that comes, a lot of the resource comes from here. So we came up with this thing called 2020 Vision. And what it is, this is the idea. And I prayed, I asked God, how are we going to raise the money? We need 50 grand because we need to raise up money for an accountant. And we also need to raise up money for some extra staff to come in part time to help out. 50 grand or there or thereabouts. So I said, how are we going to do that? Because we take up an offering where people come and, you know, give their kidney and, you know, different stuff. And we sell it on eBay or, you know, do we do kidney for the cause or, do you know what I mean? Stuff like that. You know what I mean? We could raise it up with a couple of kidneys, two or three kidneys. Well, Victory Outreach, five, five or six kidneys because they're well used. <laughs> Don't get as much money for them on eBay. But jokes aside, jokes aside, guys, so I know time's cracking on. 2020 is the thing. People pay their tithes and offerings, and you're very faithful in this church. Very faithful. People pay. They pay United We Can. United We Can is our fund where we get that money and we send out the couple to go and plant the church. They get a, a, an upfront amount to be able to get equipment and stuff and rent places and then they get supported for two years every month so that they can go and start a church in an inner city and reach out to drug addicts. We already have that in place. That's what Run for Hope's raising money for. And you know how much money it, it costs to start a church in just the basic ways, probably about 50 grand. 40 or 50 grand. And we've done four. We've, we've helped four. Amen. We've got another two coming in the next year. But we've already got that. That's, that's, that's cool. That's the United We Can. That does that. Amen. But this, this is to employ someone full time in the church. He's working already. He works for a massive charity. Amen. But he wants to work for us. Are you with me? Because he, he's, he's part of us. He loves us. And he's qualified and he's good at what he does. So 2020, how does it work? Well, I believe that if we get 20 people that can pay an extra or commit to pay an extra 100 pounds a month, just 20, 100 pounds a month on top of your, 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 your giving already. So it's an extra 100 pounds a month. Not either or, not robbing Peter to pay Paul, but a stretch of faith, an investment. Right? That's two grand a month. Okay? And then if we get 100 people that can pay an extra 20 pound a month, that's another two grand a month. That's 4,000 pounds a month, which over 12 months is 48 grand, which is near or near enough what we need to be able to take on a fully qualified, full-time accountant that's going to be able to help us with our budgeting, help us with our administration, help us with all of our funding stuff, We've got so many projects, man. It's going to blow you away. We've got cafe projects. We've got outreach projects. We've got pop-up projects. We've got community stuff that's going on. We've got homes that we want to raise up and buy. And we've already got 50 grand to be able to put down into a new men's home. It's already there. But this is for, we need someone that's going to help us out. Because I've only got 10 fingers and toes. Pastor Kevin's got 10 fingers and toes. Vicky's got 10 fingers and toes. That's about as far as we can go. We need someone that can go beyond fingers and toes. Amen. So there it is. 100 people, 20 pound a month. 20 people, 100 pound a month. And then we would be able to take on someone that's going to take us through to the next level. How many of you want a church of integrity, transparency, financial accountability? Church that budgets, church that takes care and stewards God's money even better than we do right now. Amen. Then what I want to do is, and I'm going to be doing this every, every week because I've already, he's already handed his notice in and we're taking him on in October. And if I have to go and get a part-time job to pay for it, I will. If I have to send my wife out to work.
Huh? But I believe that it's all in the house. We're, we're going to be a part of it. We're a part of everything. We pay our tithes to this church. We pay United We Can ourselves. We're diamond members, in actual fact. Like three, four hundred a month to United We Can, plus tithes and offerings. So we give. We, 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 we're, not just t- we're not just saying it. We, we lead from the front. We believe in this. Amen. And God blesses us. I want us to pray. There's going to be these forms that are available. Amen. They're going to be available at the back. You can get one. If God puts it upon your heart to be one of these people, one of the 20 or one of the, the 100. It's 2020. 20 for 100, 100 for 20. 2020 vision. We're looking forward to the future. Amen. Father, we thank you today. We thank you that you're building your church, but you're partnering with us. We are your church. We are your body. This is for us. It's about us. It's not just a little select group of people that are going to benefit from people's blind giving. This is about all of us benefiting from all of our giving, creating an atmosphere, creating an environment for other people that are lost to come in and find salvation, hope, freedom and deliverance place where people can come and find family. place where people can come and find purpose. A place where people can come and use what it is you've given them. Not just to get more wealth, die rich and leave it all behind. But God to invest in eternity. So, Father, I thank you and bless you. In Jesus' name. You know what? Just, I just want to do this. I've been asked if I can do this to make it easier. Is if, if you want to get involved in any way, you're thinking about getting involved right now. Amen. In whatever way. I'm not going to ask who's going to give the more and who's going to give the less. It's not about any of that. It's about getting involved. Just for the sake of ease from the ushers, could you lift up your hand and one of the ushers is just going to come and they're going to put something in your hand. You can take it away. Amen. As the worship team come back, so they take theirs and then come back. Praise the Lord. Just so that they don't miss out also. Praise the Lord. You can come back. 